you so much, Rich, and it's a pleasure to see everybody. Nice to see John back from China. Nice to see Dermot here. Nice to see Wolfgang. And very nice to see Dick joining us. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the second volume in a trilogy, which is always complicated, but is really good uh, in terms of a discipline of does it make sense. Uh, and what I'm going to do is basically as follows. First, I'll just give a little background about what the trilogy is about. And I'll stand so up. first, what I'll do is I'll describe the overall vision. And it's a big picture. It's big ideas about what the three books are about. And it was always going to be a very big project. Anything that gives you money for six years, you really need to develop. Um, but you need to know a little bit about the first, and then this is the second, and then where it's going as well. Then what I'll do is I'll recap on the conceptual framework. And again, I know some of you here have heard this a lot, and so you're very familiar. Some of you, it might be newer. And so we'll cover all of that. And then a little bit about the evidence. And this is both the perception of electoral integrity index, it's the World Value Survey, and then it's the institutional context. And then really the meat and potatoes of what we want to get to, which is how do we think about explaining why an election is flawed or why an election is failed. And I think that there are three plausible arguments. And so I want to set those out, and I hope as a group we'll think through the pros and cons of each of the different views. The first one is essentially that there are structural determinants. As Lipsit would argue about democracy, certain social issues, certain economic factors, certain geographic factors which are largely fixed, can't really be changed by us, are going to determine whether an election succeeds or fails. Think about Afghanistan, think about DRC, think about some of the countries where we're trying elections, and maybe we're setting them up to fail. Second explanation is that it's about international engagement. And this is a view which is really popular in a lot of the literature which is focused on electoral observers. It's derived from IR scholars, but it's really about what the international community does when it tries to strengthen democratic norms and how countries are being affected by technical assistance, development aid, neighborhood effects. If you live next to Russia or if you live next to the United States, you might have different types of patterns of elections. And so again, this is largely derived from the literature on democratization, but you could apply it to why an election works. Maybe it's the way in which the community, the international community has helped, and those global norms that come across your borders. The third explanation, though, is one which I think is equally important, but really has not been theorized or conceptualized properly, and it's the one I'm focusing on. In the sense, what I'm doing right now, I always, when I have a book, I love to have some tension in it. I love to have plausible candidates. It's rather like a murder mystery. You know, it could be the butler, and it could be the maid, or it could be the aunt. Um, and they're all equally motivational, so it's an Agatha Christie in a way. But I think that the power sharing is an idea which we always know from Lightheart, which I've written about in the past. Consensus or consensual or, or, or consensational democracies have a long intellectual pedigree. Um, but when it comes to electoral governance, and I put those two phrases together, it's about how we run elections, how we regulate them, how we have laws, how we implement the decisions and the procedures. How we actually think about power sharing really hasn't been brought together. And my argument for the book is that this is potentially important, but it's like a structural constraint, certainly on policy making. You live in a particular country, you've got fixed conditions, and you can't easily change those. They're long-term evolutionary patterns. This can be important. Again, I'm not dismissing it. I'm not saying there's only a single explanation. I really hate so much of the literature which sets off by bright young things to say everything else is junk, and my theory is the only one, which so many articles seem to do nowadays. Instead, I think that's important, but it's limited in its capacity, largely because even the international actors have to work through domestic agencies. They themselves don't run the elections. They help agencies, or they help governments, or they help NGOs to do a better job. So I think we need to unpack what we mean by power sharing electoral governance and really think, is this the way that we can help to explain when an election works and doesn't work? And then, just lastly, the plan of the book uh, overall and what needs still to be done. Uh -huh. Interesting. Now, your, the screen is moving and my thing isn't, which is another way of doing it. But, so the three books. The first one, I'm pleased to say, is going to be out in June. Um, and that's the one which is really taking electoral integrity as an independent variable and explaining lots of things. How far does that impact on things like our feelings of legitimacy, confidence in parties, trust in institutions, turnout, protest, and ultimately regime stability? So that book was my last year's work, and that was based largely on the World Value Survey, understanding how 
perceptions of electoral integrity might affect behaviour and then regimes. The second volume then wants to build on that, but reverse the causality. So here what I'm talking about is if we have uh, patterns of electoral, um, if we have various factors in a country or in a polity, what causes electoral integrity and dramatically what uh, the headline is why does it fail or why is it flawed? And that therefore builds on the first one. And then lastly, <coughs> policy. It's not just enough to analyse this. This is a real critical issue to so many countries. It's important in places obviously like Afghanistan, uh, Indonesia or India going on right now, but also co equally in countries like Canada or Australia or Britain or the United States. So this is the next, <laughs> this is like the ghosts of Christmas past, right? That's the ghosts of Christmas past, that's the ghosts of Christmas future, <coughs> to mix my metaphors. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go, but I'm certainly kind of clear about the overall outlines and the vision of what we want to do. <laughs> so we're thinking about agenda setting, that's the first volume get attention to this phenomena in the profession, get attention to this in the international community, then try to analyse with good rig rigorous empirical evidence and robust explanations and rethink some of those explanations. And then lastly, um, not all the factors that you can explain by can you change. So what's the most effective policy interventions that you can use using experimental research for 2015? So this is how it flows theoretically and we'll see, hopefully, this will be out in 2015, and this one in 2016. Now, this is, as I said, the first one. So this is simply the theories, the evidence, the concepts, the problems, and then the consequences. And that book, at a very reasonable price, no less, with Cambridge, is coming out soon. The second one. How do I think about this? Well, um, first, obviously, one sets out the arguments and these three different tensions in the literature of pre previous literatures that you can draw upon and arguments, different kinds of evidence, a little bit again on PEI, and then taking each of the explanations seriously and building on them and integrating them. So they're not seen as separate, but they actually come together. And then also thinking about what I've now termed risk point challenges, which sounds very po policy wonkish, but anyway. Uh, some of the key challenges, some of the major issues. I had a long list, but I have to really narrow it down to get a manageable book. So problems of electoral authorities, inclusive electoral rules, competitive campaigns, <coughs> security, and then ultimately the conclusions uh, leading on to the next volume. And then the last book is really all about all the mechanisms, ideally. And again, we're going to have to talk about this as a team and think through effective, rigorous uh, randomised controlled trials where we work with different agencies to talk about what they're doing and it could be under, for example, electronic voting or it could be under electoral monitoring, although I think there's a lot of work already done on that. It could be under the media, it could be under the legal processes, it could be under um, capacity building. There's lots of things which the international community and domestic actors are trying to improve electoral integrity. We don't know what works, basically. We're in the dark. We're putting lots and lots of money, lots of resources into this we haven't the foggiest about its real effects. So I think there's a big agenda here that hopefully by the time we get to that, we'll have a better sense of what's going on in the map and where we need to go. So let's just recap then on the concepts. When we talk about flawed and failed, the first thing is obviously what's the challenges? Is it my view? Is it Dick's view? Is it Britch's view? And it's really a contested concept um, we often talk in the language of things like um, uh, free and fair, but that's so slippery. It means nothing for most people. Genuine elections is also used. And there are various other terms. In a sense, when it happens, we all know it. <coughs> and we know it very clearly just from some recent examples in Asia, which Max has been very good at looking at. In the case of Malaysia, we've, caught, we've been caught up a little bit in their controversies. We rank them very low in the PEI. The opposition's absolutely taken that up a clear case where the opposition has claimed fraud, vote buying, but particularly gerrymandering. I think that's clearly the case because the leading party, their share of the vote came down, but they won basically almost two thirds of seats. Cambodia, another classic case of absolute stalemate and instability. Court contested between the Reds and, the, and, and, and other factions. Mass protests, continuing opposition, boycotts and real problems, Bangladesh, always going on, less in the headlines, but very much a problem of always being unstable despite frequent elections. And Thailand, 
another case with inconclusive results, <coughs> where a government has been destabilized and there's nothing much that they can do until they can rerun those 10%, which is very unlikely. So we know the problems, right? But let me emphasize that it's not just the newer democracies or the transitional regimes where these are a problem. Here are just a few in the um, Western mature democracies as well. And we all know about the United States, which is getting worse and worse and worse, frankly. If one looks at these developments in the last period since 2000 and Florida, more and more litigation, more and more polarization, states passing exactly the opposite laws. Some expanding voting facilities, like in Massachusetts, others directly restricting them in all sorts of ways. And I think that this polarization and partisanship is really damaging. And of course, I also think that the problems are going on with uh, deregulation of campaign funding, the recent decision just been made in the Supreme Court. But even in Canada, in Canada, this is what shocked me. They passed a, a so-called fair election, or they're proposing to pass a so-called fair elections act, which is going to suppress voters, especially young voters, mobile voters who don't have any proof of identity. And it's going to reduce the power of the in independent EMB. In the UK, we've had problems of postal votes being abused, Again, the more easy the facilities are to vote, the more the potential abuses are for certain communities and concern about fraud. In Western Australia, we all know the problem just now about the lost ballots, which Rodney has, uh, knows much more about than I do, and the do-over at the third election in just a short period, which is going to change the results. Any election administration that goes wrong is clearly going to have consequences. And in the EU, I'm really interested in what's going to happen in May, because there's so many small parties out there, the protest parties, and recently, uh, the court has said that vote thresholds um, are not allowed. And so, essentially, a lot of the small parties that would not have otherwise been included are going to be included. A major controversy, I think, about to hit in terms of the EU election, along with <laughs> record low turnout, I predict. So the problems are there in many unstable states, but they're also there in states which have a larger reservoir of legitimacy, but where elections or people's expectations of elections uh, that it should work, but they're clearly not working in different ways. So here's the concept. This is what I'm essentially putting on the table. It's, again, not from democratic theory. I'm not kowtowing to Bob Dahl. I'm not using the normative values. What I'm saying is it's the international commitments. So our, vo our vision of electoral integrity is what the international community has agreed to. What's been signed in conventions right back from 1948 through 1966, through more recent um, agreed written guidelines by, say, the Organization of American States or the Organization um, um, uh, uh, OSCE or a variety of others, the EU and the Venice Commission and so on. So it's the international commitments and global norms, some of which are more precise than others, some of which are vaguer than others, but they're endorsed by the governments themselves. So the governments have signed on to these conventions, these protocols, these guidelines, and increasingly, they are covering all of the world. The Arab League has picked this up. The AU has picked this up. Every country now realizes that there are these global norms. And of course, every country except more or less five nowadays has elections. So they're the universal standards. Now, again, to emphasize, some of these are very abstract. When it hits the ground, when the rubber hits the road, it's difficult to know what they mean in practice often. But some basic things are there. Obviously, universal voting rights, secret ballots, and so on. Many other issues, however, particularly things like money and politics, far less consensus. The media regulation, something which John has worked on, something which there's far less agreement at all, even uh, amongst Western democracies. But there are standards which apply, again, not just at the end point. And again, so much work has been done on fraud at the ballot box with the assumption that somehow you've got either voter impersonation or miscounts. That's not really the problem we find. The real problems are much earlier on pre-election, you fiddle the uh, mal malapportionment or change the gerrymandering of your districts, or you imprison certain opposition candidates, or you suppress certain groups from even registering, and of course you don't need to worry about manipulation at the end, that's very crude. And it might be during the campaign, and this by the way is again where the PEI says there's the worst problems, it's about money in the media. They're clearly the highest, according to the experts, in nearly every country, including the problems of money, which is why we're taking that up. And then, of course, also on polling day and in its aftermath. You can have an election that works well. Uh, Nigeria is a case in point. But the aftermath is one of immense communal violence, which delegitimizes the government and the outcome and the results. So problems occur throughout the cycle. 
And by contrast, quite simply, we use the term malpractice to refer to the problems which are associated. It's actually a better term than flawed or failed, but flawed or failed gives you a better headline as you wherever you're selling your books. So we've got these issues, and this is our vision of how it works according to the different stages of the cycle. And again, as I said, a lot of work, for example, the analysis of election observers is all about when you put people into that election and there's a vote count or the results, is it accurate? Well, that's good, that's important. We shouldn't dismiss that, particularly where ballots get lost in Western Australia. But if you've got all these problems early on, in a sense, uh, it's shutting the barn door after, etc., etc. to <laughs> give you another analogy. So that's our vision of what we're doing. And what we now need to say is how do we then measure each of those? And then how do we analyze what the problems are? What's the explanations? So how do we <coughs> analyze this? Well, clearly, there's all sorts of indicators out there. But we've obviously developed our own through our PEI. And again, a lot of you have been part of that, so you know a lot of what we're doing here. <coughs> the goal is to cover every country worldwide, national elections, parliamentary and presidential, very ambitious, starting in mid-2012 but running on. So Farhan has a job until his pension as we, if we keep going doing this. We've uh, already done quite a lot of the world. We only keep out the countries like Luxembourg and so on, the microstates, basically because we can't find enough political scientists in many of those countries. And we've got over 8,000, and this is again the team has gathered all the experts through a rigorous method that I mentioned, We've covered so far 73 elections in 66 countries, but next year, how many for Africa? Another 16? Yeah, another 16. Yeah, so we've done a third so far, we'll do another third next 60 year. 60 countries or 60? 60 countries plus. So by the end of that, we'll have done two thirds of the world, and then the world is our oyster, we keep running through, Hitler has nothing on us, and the following uh, will continue. And we obviously give all our data away free immediately, we've done it at the end of the year because there's an awful lot of people out there who want to look at these issues. There's a tremendous generation of younger graduates who come from many countries where this is vital. And if they can get the data, they can do a lot of things with it. We want to kind of seed the profession to take this off. So we've had our expert definition, and again, we can talk about that, but we have talked about that in the past. And Farron and Rich can both talk about that in more detail, and, and others. We use a lot of questions, so we try to have each of those stages monitored by more than one indicator. If you use one, it could be skewed for a variety of reasons. If you have a scale, you have two or three, you get much more of a robust measure. And so these are just some examples. They're both positive and negative. And if you're the experts, for example, if Dick is being asked about Canada, then you're asked these 49 questions within a month of your election at the federal level. And you're asked on the five-point scale how you would evaluate each of these things. Rich does his magic with imputation for where we have gaps, and we end up with our scale. So the first thing we can do, obviously, is just to look at the overall 100-point scale across all countries. And therefore, when we're thinking about explanations, the key challenge is why are these countries at the top? Well, Norway at the top, well, of course. Every time I do anything in democracy, Norway comes out at number one, uh, along with Sweden, maybe, and Denmark, and other countries in the north. But nevertheless, that's not surprising. Germany, yes, the Netherlands, yes. But if one looks down, you quickly come across some of the newer democracies in Europe. The Czech Republic, not too bad. Korea, although that one, by the way, is highly disputed because of some sort of things that happened afterwards. And the Korean press lit up with our little survey because they thought it was down here, didn't they? The uh, Korean EMB loved it, however. But look, we've got Slovenia, we've got uh, Lithuania, we've got Rwanda which is really interesting. And again, that could be method methodological, or it could be that maybe the election worked. Uh, I'll put that part back for a minute. As we go down, again, we get various countries, but then let's look at the bottom countries. Are they what you would expect? And again, that kind of common sense of test of, is the index working? Equatorial Guinea, Djibouti, Congo Republic, Belarus, Cambodia, Angola, Zimbabwe, <coughs> Malaysia. And again, Malaysia got a lot of attention. The press there kept on saying, well, <laughs> we're just above Zimbabwe, this is not good. The opposition in particular. Ukraine and so on. So we can analyze the overall pattern. And that, in a sense, is my dependent variable for my, my, my current book. Why do we get that variation? And then you can also diagnose in more detail. 
So for an EMB, giving you a 100-point scale doesn't really help, because what can you do with it? You're at the bottom, you're at the top. But what we do is we put all of our 11 indices, cluster them, <coughs> and create, again, scales for each of those out of 100. So you can see immediately, what's the problem in Armenia? Well, voter registration seems to be the problem. What's the problem in the Republic of Congo? And what's the problem in the United States? And quite simply, boundaries, district boundaries and, and partisanship. And voter registration and money. So you can diagnose it through using that, or if you're really interested in any one indicator, you can do that as well. You want just to know about um, the role of money in politics, you can just focus on that, or whatever. So it's a diagnostic tool that we hope could be useful. And we also ask about some similar issues with the public. Now again, the public is the World Value Survey for us, and we're still collecting data. Today I just had Nibia come in with their data. <laughs> Yesterday I had time and come in. And we're about to finish off the sixth wave. But we ask the public in a wide range of countries similar questions to the questions that we ask in the experts. And this allows us both to test, is it the experts, for example, are all to the left and have a particular view, or they're all international, or they have a view. Does the public agree with them? And again, some of these questions that we brought up very fast uh, are nice, simple, straightforward questions which tap into many aspects of the electoral cycle. It's not a perfect match. But it covers things, for example, at the very beginning, it covers things in the count, it covers things in the campaign, and in the polls, and so on. And just to give you a quick snapshot, this is my current version of the World Value Survey. I'm going to have this in um, about 40 countries by the time we finish, where we've asked the public about their views on electoral integrity with a fair uh, four-point scale. We ask them about their views on electoral malpractice the other way around, and we can see that does it make some sense, just in terms of coherence, well, the Netherlands and Germany come out particularly high. Germany, not surprising in a way. Quite interesting, by the way, they're always still dividing it up into east and west. You might have thought they might have learnt that things have moved on, but nevertheless, we have two societies there. Um, and then a variety of countries, and then a variety of problem cases, Nigeria, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Zimbabwe, Lebanon, etc. Do the experts and the public agree? Well. We don't have a perfect match in terms of countries. The world values covered some countries. The expert survey has covered those with elections. But as you can see, if we just look at the two, this is the public and the same four questions about their views of electoral integrity. This is the experts and their views. And broadly speaking, there's a pretty good match with a couple of important exceptions, some outliers that we need to really think through what's going on. So if you're in Ukraine as a member of the public, a citizen, you really have poor views about integrity in your country, and if you're, in, uh, as did the experts, and if you're in the Netherlands or in Australia, it's pretty good. But this also allows us to, to look about why might it be that some cases are seen as better by the public or experts, and really disentangle some of this and look at it in more detail. Similarly, if we look at the um, four problems of the electoral malpractice index, we find a similar nice pattern. The experts, which are there, go down, and the public, which are here, kind of agree. If you're in the Netherlands, although interestingly, again, Farrell, we're going to have to look at this, Rwanda, the public says it's not bad either. So, and then Australia is more or less on the line, and many other countries, the public and the experts agree. Okay. Well, let me then quickly turn to the explanation. What are the arguments? Why would some countries be down the bottom of the rank and other countries be up the top? Well, the first explanation is essentially Lips it. Seymour Martin, 1959, The Social Determinants of Democracy. And his core argument, as we all know, is that socioeconomic development and whatever we know as modernization produce changes in society which are conducive to the transition from autocracy and the growth of democracy. The Lipsis thesis. And there are many factors which uh, should also predict electoral integrity. After all, elections are so critical to liberal democracy that if it does one, it should do the other. So one set of explanations should be things like physical geography, your location, who are you next to? Are you next to Russia? Are you next to China? Are you next to the United States? Are you next to Europe? Clearly that could be really important if you think even of Central and Eastern Europe. How do you explain, for example, Georgia and Ukraine versus, say, the Czech Republic and Lithuania? Neighborhood effects could be part of what's going on. But similarly, physical size, it's so easy to do an election in a smaller country, in a country like Russia, 
the challenges in, in Afghanistan are, are immense. An agrarian economy, which means a less literate population, amongst other things, and a more dispersed rural population, vulnerability to tropical diseases, neighborhood effects, poverty. I mean, there's a whole bunch of factors which are associated with that. Colonial legacies, which you can't change. If you're drawn, if you are nowadays with the wrong boundaries because some colonial British idiot drew all your communities all together, that's the legacy that you have. Similarly, a lot of the constitution and the legal legacy, whether it's what type of law you have, is, is a long-standing fixed pattern. And clearly, <coughs> ethnic heterogeneity is a plausible explanation. The countries which are divided are always seen as the ones which are most vulnerable to risk of war and other forms of conflict politicized through parties. And again, there's a good literature on that. Although whether ethnicity should be treated as immutable and unchangeable and fixed, or whether it's constructed, by politicians is a big argument again in the literature. Cultural values, the type of religion, perhaps some types of religion are more vulnerable than others, to problems of both democracy and therefore quality of elections, and the oil curse. How, how on earth do we explain why, despite the hopes of the Arab uprising, it's petered out um, and it's had such modest effects in so many countries other than Tunisia, Libya, uh, and in Egypt it's all gone the wrong way and so on. So oil curses, state capture, and rentier states and then a history of a legacy of conflicts and civil war. You try and have elections in a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo after a 30-year civil war, and somehow the international community expects it's going to work? Well, why? And yet, in every single peacekeeping uh, initiative we've now had in the last uh, 20 years in the post-Cold War era, we've tried to have elections very early on. So maybe that's the problem. If Fixed conditions are important, of course. The problem is, the challenge is that, uh, what do you do? Uh, the international community can't not have elections. It's committed to human rights. That's how we get a legitimate authority. But on the other hand, if they're going to fail because of the structural conditions, it's a high risk and an investment that we have to really think through. And in one of my other books, I've said you, you need to think about governance as well as democracy. If the state is so weak it can't deliver, that could be as much of a problem as if you haven't got democratic institutions. Uh, a little bit of evidence just to show you some of the patterns. Does GDP predict the pattern basically of electoral integrity? So this is our PEI expert index, and this is per capita GDP, and you can see the pattern. Is there one? Well, quite simply, there's two clusters of countries. We've got here a bunch of countries which are very much in the poorer developing category, although again, they do vary across uh, levels of development themselves. And we can see that a lot of those do indeed have very poor quality electoral integrity, according to the experts. But there's this other big, big scatter. And what this says, essentially, is that there's a tremendous range. And all of these are countries which are classified by the experts as having not bad elections by a variety of criteria, whether it's the Czech Republic, remember I said, or the Korean Republic, or Iceland, or Germany, or the Netherlands. But their level of economic development is incredibly varied right away from some of the most affluent countries in the world with a per capita income of almost 50,000 down to those which are really uh, middle income, a Chile, a Lithuania, 10,000 per capita GDP. So quite simply, when one eyeballs the evidence, there's some patterns, but it's not in any way a strong predictor, particularly at a curvilinear pattern once you get past a certain level. Uh, you're, you can have good elections in countries which are pretty poor, although it does seem that poverty is a problem for, and I'd, I'd interpret that, by the way, as about the resources for governance. If you're a really poor state, you don't even have a civil service that's effective, you can't run an election very easily, you don't have good transport, you don't have communications, lots of things can go wrong. So you can have in India, clearly an election which is moderate or high quality in a poor country, but it's a problem. What about democracy? Is that a structural factor? Well, here again, we can just um, look at it as a eyeballing the data. Now, the problem, of course, uh, is that both Freedom House and Polity in themselves both really have elections at the heart of their definition. So if there is a correlation, which there is, it's kind of just uh, circular. You need really better measures of different dimensions of democratization than the standard ones that we always use in order to look at this relationship. Is there a relationship? Yes. And uh, it's also interesting, by the way, that it's a slightly um, the best pat fit is a slightly curvilinear pattern. But would I place a lot of emphasis on this? Not until I've actually got better indicators 
and uh, dis disaggregated indications of democratization. For example, does rule of law predict electoral integrity? Does uh, good governance, like lack of corruption in governance, predict <coughs> electoral integrity? It's only if you can break those out, uh, and again, Min is thinking about these challenges as well, it's only if you've got a measure which is not in itself about elections that you can actually look at the relationships adequately here. But it gives us some indications that some institutions might go, go together, as you would expect. Second explanation, and then I'll get on to my key explanation. Second explanation is the international engagement. And all the IR scholars, including Danielle Adono, in particular her new book, Susan Hyde, Judith Kelly, and many others, have all been looking at electoral observers. And the argument is that we have a variety of different uh, carrots and sticks as an international community. And we can therefore try and enforce global norms, and democr democratization and elections are now global norms. As we said, only five countries around the world don't have any competitive elections for the federal level. So what can we do? Well, we can use development aid as soft power, and we can both conditionally, conditionally allocate it or retrospectively allocate it, give money to those countries which have really moved up, like Burundi, and that's very much what the MCA in America did, uh, the Earth Millennium Challenge Account. Technical assistance, UNDP and all the others are always going into the countries and trying to help build up the human capacity, build up the skills, build up the uh, ability to have security forces who are well trained, build up civic society agencies and the media. We can also provide diplomatic pressures and conventions, again for failure, and things like trade sanctions. And of course there are more broad patterns of diffusion in places like Latin America and Central Eastern Europe. You really can't explain those two countries without some form of diffusion. All those member states that wanted to join the EU really moved up fast before they joined. The ones that didn't uh, stay stagnant or now moved backwards. Latin America, despite all of the problems in countries which have occurred, like Venezuela and Peru, it's never going to go back to where it was in, in terms of the quality of elections of, of the 1980s or the 1970s. It's not going to have a military coup. It's never going to have such. And again, there's a, a, a regional effect going on. And so Levitsky and Way, in particular, Steve and, uh, and Lucan, have basically said, well, we can think of these things conceptually when it comes to democracy in terms of these concepts of leverage and linkage. Linkage is kind of the automatic stuff, flows over your border. Leverage are the pressures that we try and put on countries. And both of those can be used to explain electoral autocracies or competitive autocracies. But empirically, how does this work for elections? Again, it's a big theory. How can we apply it? Well, most of the work, nearly all the work, has been done mainly on electoral observers. It's quite interesting how much has been done on that. What I would argue is that the more general effects of most of these things on elections are essentially anecdotal, case study based, and really unsystematic. And essentially, it might have an impact that's very positive, but I'm kind of agnostic. And just to show you what we don't know, and this, by the way, is uh, stealing from Donald Rumsfeld, of all people. Uh, what we know and what we don't know, and what, um, the known unknowns and all that sort of stuff. Uh, let me give you what the policy options are and why we don't know much about this. So monitoring, and by the way, this is very relevant for Max, is very much what we have focused on. When an international mission goes into a country and in the campaign observes what's going on and writes its report, does that have an impact? But there's also domestic NGOs, really important. Do they have an impact? And there's also social media, which we know should be important, but we don't know what the impact is. So that's an area which Max is looking at very broadly. And again, how do we think about that? But this is just one thing that we do as an international community. We also build the capacity of the EMBs, which means human capital, the people, the skills, the training. That's something we do all the time. Every time there's an election in Nigeria, everybody goes off to a little training workshop. I mean, it's so static. We also have to think about technology. It's not just putting in the right people. But if in, in Kenya, the international community in the last election gave them 120 million for new technologies, right at the late, late de date, no, everybody realized they didn't know how to work them. They all broke down. There was no electricity. They were put into a dust pile, and they went back to paper. Uh, if, by contrast, in India, technology works because it's homegrown, it's indigenous. So again, how does that work, and how does that affect basic security, effectiveness of voter registration, and things like that? Legal regulation is the third thing we do. Electoral laws, how do they have an impact? And not just about electoral systems, but about very detailed matters like how do you register? 
What's the distance by law between the polling station and where the voters are? What's the ways of uh, voter identification? I mean, this is where the rubber hits the road in so many countries. We need to know about campaign funding. And again, we've got a new project moving ahead on that. And there's almost no decent work uh, in recent years which has really done a comparative survey uh, to analyze either what's out there or what's effective. International idea has done a bit, but not much. And political broadcasting, something that John is interested in. The regulation of what happens during the campaign. Do you get free media? Can you buy media? Is it regulated tightly? Is it not? <coughs> All of those things we know very little about on a comparative basis, I think. Accountability mechanisms are equally important. Complaints adjudication. When your election goes wrong, who do you go to? Do you go back to the EMB? Well, if they're the ones who conducted the election, isn't there a contradiction? And this again comes back to John's idea of monitoring democracy or monitorial democracy, how you can build in other types of oversight mechanisms, for example, through the courts or through other NGOs who perhaps could adjudicate in an authoritative way. Parliamentary oversight could be really important. And then international pressures, sanctions, diplomacy, and so on. So what I'm saying here just on this page is that there are lots of things that we do and all we seem to focus on ex excessively is this, which is, for me, too late. It's the thing that happens once the election is being counted, but it's not the most important. And most money goes into this, not into this. So the research community needs to really examine all of these things to think about impacts. And lastly, my argument in the book is going to be that, yes, structural constraints limit what you can do. You go into a hostile, challenging environment, you can't change that. Uh, and international pressures, where there's international engagement, can be important. But above all, the international community works through domestic institutions. So the core argument, where I'm going to put my money on, but I haven't yet got there, <coughs> is that we need to think about power-sharing forms of electoral governance. So what have we got out there in the literature? We've got a few studies which are starting to emerge of EMBs, but they're very crude. We really don't know the effect of electoral management bodies. We've started to look a bit at electoral administration, but it's a dusty corner of public administration 101. There's a few people who really love it, like Thad Hall, Michael Alvarez in America, but most even public administration people don't take it seriously. So public sector management. And <coughs> we've got a lot of work on electoral systems, which is a form of power sharing, but it's not necessarily the most important one in removing the problems which cause failed and flawed elections. I do believe that PR is going to have positive impact on our electoral integrity index. And so far, my figures from what I've been looking at seem to show that's true. <coughs> but we have to actually think about other forms of power sharing. Think about how an election works and how it's governed. And I think that we need to think about who are the bodies, who are the agencies, who are the government groups who are actually responsible for implementing how an election works. And what you're trying to do it's quite complicated, but what you're trying to do in all cases, I think, is to avoid single party capture. In other words, what we've done so far in this literature is focus on structures, but not really a broader vision of what it means to have power sharing governments. So we need to really classify the impact and the roles and the independence of the EMDs, the electoral management bodies, yes, but also what's the role of the courts. In Egypt, for example, it was the Constitutional Court which invalidated the election. Uh, and many other courts are responsible for adjudication. We need to think about boundary commissions, who sets those up, how are they constituted, are they part of the parliament, are they part of an independent group, broadcasting authorities, because they regulate a lot of the campaign and have to uh, uh, give people rules for that, parliaments who have oversight over the budget and over a variety of other aspects, the media and NGOs, not forgotten John, because again, they can play an important role of oversight and keeping other, other groups into account. So all of these are things which are part of our agenda. And, and really, it's uncharted territory, I think. We've been looking at this um, with a few people, doing a, a little bit at the edges. But nobody's looked centrally at whether these conditions, and in particular, the multiple agencies that prevent single party capture, are the critical aspects. So we need to push ahead on our concepts, and then our evidence, and then some of our measures, if we can do that. I do have a looking model, but it doesn't really say anything. So, and I keep on moving things around anyway. Um, how I put these things. So we all like that. Conclusions. And then Dick can come in and criticize something. 
And I, do, I do feel sorry for you in the sense that it's a bit like coming into the second part of uh, Star Wars or The Godfather when you haven't really been part of the first part and you don't really know where the third part's going and so on, so it's not... Or maybe it's the Harry Potter series or whatever it is. Anyway. So just to recap, this is what, we've, this is what I'm, I'm thinking about. And this is what I'm working on with the current book. So it's saying, essentially, let's set out some arguments. And there are other arguments, clearly. There's rational actor arguments, which I'm not addressing. And that's very popular in much of the authoritarianism literature, which assumes that you've got an actor who's trying to manipulate the elections, etc. Uh, I just find that very difficult to know how I can incorporate that. But I've got three arguments, which I think are plausible. They each have a long intellectual pedigree. They come from the tradition of the work on what causes democracy, but applies it to elections. And I think thinking how they build on each other and interact is a large challenge. And then ultimately also put, putting in some case study chapters, because all of this aggregate stuff is great, but I have no time series from a lot of the, obviously, PEI and other things. And so determining causality is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, even with the most heroic models. So here what we could do is we can take some process cases, paired cases of change, where the electoral authority, for example, was changed a decade ago. Has it had an impact on the quality of election? Where we look at rules on, regula on registration for, for parties and for candidates, where we look at rules on uh, electoral systems, and again, look at some cases of change. Uh, competitive campaigns, this is about money and the media, and then electoral security, the problems of instability. Those remain quite fuzzy, it has to be said in my mind, but that's good, because I don't want to get there until I get there, if you know what I mean. I always like to know I'm going towards the light, <laughs> but if I know what the answer is at the beginning of the book, why am I writing it? Uh, and then kind of pulling it together. Uh, so uh, first of all, just thank you for having me. This is a, a, an amazing uh, moment. Uh, I mean, I, I know about the Electoral Integ Integrity Project, not least because people keep reminding me at places <laughs> we meet on the other side of the planet. Um, but I never really actually engaged with its, its content and its structure as much as I've had to in the last couple of days, and that's really been something. I mean, it is an astonishingly ambitious program, and who better than Pippa to realize such a program? Um, but, uh, so let me, you know, so, but let me just push at a few things. Uh, That's what you hear Maybe before it's too late, I don't know. So first of all, one of the reasons why I wanted this slide up here, actually, was that I think, I think you probably want to spend a little time, I think a little harder about this yeah. and its relationship to the uh, PEI yeah. index. Um, I find it entirely plausible, the intuition embedded in the italicized bullet there. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's consistent with, uh, I think, an increasing sense that we're getting in the comparative literature on uh, governance more generally, that if you want to start somewhere, you don't necessarily start with inclusiveness in elections, you start with the rule of law. And, but nonetheless, one can ask uh, the extent to which the institutions that are uh, the mediators and moderators of opinion and choice are themselves uh, sufficiently di dispersed in their power relations so as to undermine the ability of any individual actor, in particular winners, from manipulating the rules down the road so as to prevent to perpetuate their place in office. <clears throat> I, think that's, I think that's really important, and it is really important more generally to uh, pull the analysis of electoral fairness out of the election day context. I'm absolutely right, I think. Um, but as far as that research program is concerned, it's still in its infancy, yeah. and indeed some of the stuff won't really be addressable until you accumulate year upon year of this stuff. I mean, you're, at the moment, at least, you're sitting on an essentially cross-section data set, yeah. whereas most of the propositions are inherently longitudinal in character. And, and even the accumulation of data going forward won't address a lot of the longitudinal questions because the institutional issues are in place and you have to go back and examine them. Yeah. But still, um, um, it's, 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 it's sort of at a start. So one worry is, that um, PEI, as it's constituted, a as either a, a summary dependent variable or in certain of, it, certain of its components understood as dependent variables or possible mediators or moderators in their own right, 
actually build some of this in already. And so you might want to ask yourself whether the going forward you might want actually to make PEI a little more Spartan. Um, that I think would actually add power to the argument. I'm particularly struck at the you know in the the uh, electoral laws. <coughs> I mean the electoral laws themselves are awfully getting awfully close to this particular causal thing here as well, right? And so you might even want to take them out of the index. So, so for example, if I were asked to evaluate uh, whether Canadian electoral laws are unfair to smaller parties, well, unfair by what criterion, right? I mean, if we, if, 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 are you asking me to basically engage in a um, macro critique of a, of a old-fashioned, low-detail majoritarian electoral system? Mm -hmm. Such electoral systems uh, under reward small parties by a criterion of proportionality, whatever else they do, right? You could have an impeccably fairly distributed set of electoral boundaries decided by an uh, independent commission. We do, we do independent commissions. I, I would personally contest the uh, geographic, the amount of geographic flex that Canadian electoral boundary commissions are allowed to incorporate, such that suburban writings can have two times the population of rural writings, and I personally think that that's unfair in terms of what the game is really about, but nonetheless, they at least apply that law impartially. Uh, I don't think one would accuse um, boundary commissioners in Canada of setting out to punish or reward small parties, but they're trying to represent places. But, so let's say it's impeccable, and let's say you don't have the, the, the geographic challenges of this enormous landscape that, that a place like Canada represents, and so on, so you have absolutely equal as pretty close to equal in America, certainly very close to absolute equal within the states in terms of the distribution of, of uh, house districts. And you decide how those boundaries are drawn at the moment, but let's say also that the boundaries are not being drawn in a willfully and manipulative way, you're still going to get an electoral framework that is going to produce a, a curve linear, a double log type relationship between vote chair and seat chair. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Is, is that fair at some general conceptual level to small parties to say it's unfair does smuggle into the argument uh, the, that part of the story that you want to use as, I think, very importantly and correctly as part of the larger causal story. So I'm, I'm a little uneasy that, that uh, PEI includes things like unfair to smaller parties. I frankly don't know what I'd say. You know, I would say it kind of depends on the small party. If the small party mm -hmm. concentrates its vote regionally, actually the electoral system is quite fair to it. If it, if it tries to be a more inclusive, uh, represent ideas rather than localized sentiments, then it's unfair. Uh, do, I, do I really want my electoral system to encourage certain kinds of, I mean, I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure what I think of small parties. I mean, what's a, what's, what's a small party? What is its particular moral claim? I mean, looking at Western Australia, geez. <laughs> I assume that, that, that the Greens and Palmer United have done a deal. Well, that's really a savory kind of thing in the background, isn't it? So, I, I, so, I'm worried. so that's, a, that's one thing I worry about, that you've, that you've actually got, particularly in your electoral laws, you may have, A, I, I worry that you've smuggled into the index right there some stuff that really isn't part of the international kind of quasi-empirical consensus. I'm not sure. But it's and B, you might have assigned some of what you really want to keep in, in an independent variable to the dependent variable. What, why would you want to open yourself up to that? So that's a, that's a, that's a, an issue. And then I guess the one other, um, here I guess it's a more, it's a, maybe a more normative question. I was struck that one of the, uh, let's see it here. Top leader. Only top party leaders oh, selected. Oh, that's right, five, four. Only top party leaders selected candidates. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a controversy in Canada right now. There's a, a bill that's not on the order paper, but it's a private member's bill that a lot of people are applauding, which would indeed uh, remove the uh, power that some Canadian party leaders enjoy to sign off the candidacies. It's presented as, it's, it's, it's obvious that it's anti-democratic that they have to do this. Well, I find myself thinking in terms of, kind of some principal agent issues here about who am I voting for when I vote for a party? Uh, 
can a party just allow anybody to seize its label? Um, in in, uh, in a single member district world, at least, if you want to uh, exercise leverage over the representation of disadvantaged groups in the menu of candidates, you may need to actually countenance a considerable centralization of power within a party. Right? I mean, if I, if I think of the thinking of my particular parish, if I think of the uses to which party leaders have put their de facto veto, it's largely to parachute high-profile electable women candidates, mm -hmm. right? who then become objects of scorn for being undemocratically selected, whatever it means to be democratic within a party. So I'm, I'm a little uneasy about that one. But those are, those are specific measurement quib quibbles, although I do have this larger thinking ahead to the, to the, the long run here. <clears throat> And then my other set of comments really have to do with um, the index more generally and how it plays out in the longer run of, I guess, causal inference in some sense. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, 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 I'll just, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm just reacting mostly as a, as an academic here, thinking of this as a research program. But I realize that that's not all it is. That it is that there's a. There's, a, there's also a public policy agenda, and uh, it's not for me to say what the relative balance between those is, but just thinking of um, the, the indicators more generally. So uh, I really think that it's absolutely important and uh, a powerful insight that you just cannot emphasize enough that, that election day is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm and that we need to set it in the context of the electoral cycle at a minimum, although in fact you're lifting it into a, an even larger plane of explanation. But just having the indicators themselves as spanning the electoral cycle is, is just absolutely really critical. I'm worried, however, that the way you've executed the measurement is that you've sort of then tended to push it all together. There's a hundred points scale. Yeah. Right, but there's a, natural, there's a natural tendency to talk about the PEI. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, so right away, you're starting to then slide over the, the, the possible, and what I would have thought as conceptually useful, slippage amongst the components. Yeah. Although I would worry that actually there isn't enough slippage. So I just, you know, I, further applause, the accessibility of the data, are, it is absolutely true. I mean, I, you all know this, obviously, but as an outsider, I oh, <laughs> went to the site and there they are. Uh, also, good on you for making them available in, in a variety of data formats, including R. There's a, there's a story for you right there. That's the future, I guess. It's not my future, however. I'm <laughs> <laughs> too old to go over to R, but, but certainly Stata is where I'm at. Um, and uh, so, so I, sort of, I had done a little bit of playing with the data, mainly with the, um, you know, the, 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 the 66 country level data, yeah. so the, the, the ones with the multiple elections mashed into one. <clears throat> Um, boy, well, I've got I've got all three levels of aggregation, but that's that was just kind of the quickest thing you used to get at. So with the 66 case data set, I am struck that when you look at the relationships amongst the components, boy, they're tightly packed, right? If you just do an alpha on the on the 11 indicators, mm -hmm. it's an alpha of 0.95. Right. If you look at the if you look at the the uh, item uh, inventory. Uh, of those 11, of the 11 subscale components, uh, 10, if you remove them, drop the alpha by maybe 0.01. The media, interestingly, is the only one in which actually the scale becomes a tiny bit more clear when you take it off. But they are really tightly bound together. Which is good. Well, it's, it's good if you think of the summary indicator as what you want, right. but it's not so good if, you want if what you know, that's yeah. the problem here, right? Yeah, so right. I think, I think there's, a, you, I, th I think, yeah. step back, you know, I mean, obviously if you're going to make the headlines, if you want to stir up the Malaysian press, then go for PEI, absolutely right, right? right. right? Uh, and, and, and if you can say that these are, you know, a summary sort of thing, uh, but if, if, reacting from terms of the research agenda, it would be better, I would say, if there was less articulation amongst these things. And you have to, I think you have to ask yourself, um, just think through whether some of what's going on here isn't um, a 
measurement part of the act, right? Because it's all about rating scales. 49 items, the same scale. Mm -hmm. all right, so, um, and yeah. uh, if you, you know, at least it's, 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 not, it's, it's not the sort of ruination of life commitment that to VDAM is, where you can spend weeks on that stuff. Uh, it isn't that, but it's uh, 49 items, you know, uh, but kind of this, by the norms of, uh, say, web surveys, ballpark, four to five items per minute. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not a trivial task with a, uh, with a um, modest amount of uh, reversals, but mostly positive. So you, you've got to worry that there's a measurement component that's running through a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, to the extent that it is, um, I worry that it is actually undercutting your ability to actually talk about causal relationships amongst some of these things, because um. I think you'll want to. Ah. Let me just finish, OK? Do I want to? But yeah, I think yeah, you yeah. do. Maybe eventually. I do. Uh, um, yeah. Particularly, particularly as you uh, expand your degrees of freedom through time. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. uh, so for example, uh, I would think it entirely possible that um, you know you, you've got your little model. Yep. Um, I think you want to unpack. The Actually, go to the, 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 the slide that has that. Where, the little model? The, the, the blue things? Or? Not though. No, I think it's toward the end. Okay. You're kind of with my, oh, that one there, right? That's the guy. Yeah. I know, but I keep on changing things. Right, well, but, but I think before you do, I think you need to want to sort of think about you know, fixed structural conditions, right? The different, that's, a, that's quite a menu. <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> domestic institutions is quite a menu, and then in some sense, maybe that's where we want to, that's where I would have to put them. Yeah. Uh, and inter even international engagement, but, you know, so you've got, you've got, at the moment at least, it's sort of what's, what's in, if, if this fairly represents your thinking, mm -hmm. what you've got here is essentially a, a, a recursive system with, and no interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, that, that the world's like that, but I think you actually have the, principle of capacity at least to consider looking at particular things within the boxes, but also considering the possibility of moderating relations as well as yes. mediating ones. Okay? Yes. So for example, in the, the, um, the, the you know, some of the distinct components of the PEI index might actually mediate or moderate uh, structural conditions or international engagement in, in different ways. And it would be good if we were yeah. convinced that the components of the index weren't just local manifestations of some general factor. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so I, it strikes me that different performance indicators might be, but also different, different performance indicators might be differently affected by other earlier factors. So I'd be interested to know, for example, if, if we're talking about advice to international actors mm -hmm. um, and you want to get beyond election day, well, where should we go? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then two final thoughts, you know, they're just political science-y thoughts. Um, so, for example, you, you mentioned about um, the gravitational pull of the European Union. Um, and um, <laughs> discovering, I think, of Hungary, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but still, um, uh, down the road, if you really want to push this, there will be selection issues. What kinds of countries would be, would allow themselves to be drawn in the European Union? What kinds of so there's, a, there's an issue. And then the, the thought about how this might extend over the boundary into more authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. I think that um, there are varieties of autocracy and some of those And, you know, I, I think of this as mainly out of the international relations literature, actually, but I, but it, but it strikes me applies here, too. You know, in, in that literature, when they're talking about war-making propensities of authoritarian regimes, they talk a lot about audience costs. Mm -hmm. you know, some regimes just have more alert and interventionist audiences than others. 
and that changes the behavior of the authoritarian ruler. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that, um, you know, in some sense, um, the, 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 the ability to check and balance is more than audience. It, you know, it's, it's a power issue. But there is that, that logic, I think, is a very powerful logic who's, that extends beyond the boundaries of the topics. So those are my comments. Great. Thanks so much, Dick. That's really helpful. Thank you all. Thank you so much for helping. Great. Thank you.